four dubs in a row for the Lake Show minus D'Lo, saw Lebronto dominate like his Raptor owning self. Even after James clanked the first potential game winner, plus with the Lakers devastatingly faltering a massive lead down the stretch, the Utah would ultimately leave the Salt Lake fateful in a state of shell shock, was spinning down the lane for the actual game winner. This was a definitively monster showing from the year 20, and for the most part, an extremely clutch one. That said, don't forget about AR-15 also coming through with the game on the line, making a 15-foot pull-up look seamlessly routine. Without probably the clutchest perimeter jumper from anyone on the team from AR, plus this man laying his body on the line to draw two NFL-esque charges in the fourth, LA wouldn't have pulled off this win. On the belated birthday for Bando and the second homecoming in under a week for he and Bees, a game of the year type affair went down, so let's fully break it down. Reeves trying to get it to LeBron, throws an alley-oop and LeBron dunks it. What a pass from Austin Reeves. LeBron caught it in midair and slammed it. But just 8.4% of you watching are subscribed, so hit subscribe. Also leave a thumbs up, it takes a few seconds, it makes a massive difference. Appreciate your support. We'll get to the Magic Johnson-esque masterclass, but even after Austin Reeves was forced to go back to the locker room after taking a hit in a collision with Anthony Davis, this man AR-15 was still able to embrace heavy contact on two game-changing charges. Who would have thought AR would have turned out to be better than the previous White Mamba for the Lake Show in Alex Caruso? With the Lakers regaining their place as my favorite team to watch in the association, it's truly an honor to watch Reeves do what he does. Personally, I was once KO'd playing flag football, taking a devastating Jorge Masvidal-esque knee to the head back in fifth grade. I took some pucks to the head while playing as a goalie in the GTHL for many years. From a basketball standpoint though, willingly taking contact to then be taken back to the hardwood at 100 miles per hour is something I have massive respect for. Kyle Lowry drawing charges, set a championship culture for the Raptors in 2019. All throughout the 2010s actually, Lowry was tops in charges. This season, Reeves is 7th in that department, but the charges he just drew in Utah were some of the hardest hits that anyone's taken all year. It's in the literal sense impactful charges drawn like the ones Reeves did to swing momentum down the stretch that validate the claim by many that he's the Lakers third best player. Also backing up that claim with all due respect to D-loading, Austin Reeves over his last 8 games is averaging 20.5 points, 6.8 dimes, on 74% true shooting amidst the Lakers winning 7 games over that span. Austin's plus 103 plus minus is shockingly plus 42 ahead of any other player on the roster. But without further ado, let's do some bowing down to the king. Obviously people are in disbelief of what they're witnessing from LeBron at such an advanced age, but this is the guy who traumatized Torontonians like yours truly in the playoffs annually for about half a decade. Nothing LeBron does, no matter how old he gets, shocks me anymore. Many don't properly acknowledge LeBron James as the talent that he is because they can't fathom his greatness, but I wanted to paint a picture for the conspiracy theorists of the world. Let's clear up a disrespectful narrative that Chael Sonnen, formerly of the UFC, just tried to validate about LeBron as Chael recently claimed that LeBron is on steroids. In response to that, there's no unrealistic look about LeBron's jaw or neck or anything about his body really. He's not overly aggressive in his demeanor which someone being on PEDs often resembles. Therefore, the recent claim from Sonnen is dubitably envious. Ironically, this comes from a guy who's used roids and been caught for it himself in the past in Sonnen. Sad part is, there's hundreds, if not hundreds of thousands of bots with the exact same opinion as Chael. We need to put a precise end to that narrative. The NBA is testing for roids practically every time one of their players has a dominant stretch of games. Just ask Damian Lillard, who had to do a urine sample after his 71 point game on February 27th. Now get in here, sailor. I'm going to need a urine sample. Steroids may have a place in the WWE or the old days of the UFC, but this is a respected team sport, the second largest major sport in the world we're talking about with the NBA. The reason why Chael Sonnen's viciously disrespectful Le narrative is so damn blasphemous is because people like him who make baseless, thinly veiled claims are barring gullible fans into not fully appreciating and at the very least a top two player of all time. 
In Utah, this man was just blowing past anyone put in his path and throwing it down with vicious willpower, even as the game reached overtime at his age that's just insane. Yet, since haters can't believe it, again, they make baseless claims and ruin it for others. Quite frankly, as you've heard time and time again, and we shouldn't have to repeat like a broken radio, LBJ is taking care of his body better than anyone in sports history, spending millions on it every year. He's also been perfectly durable because of his ability within the course of a game to both utilize safe movements and under control takeoffs. Combine that with a relentlessly driven mindset and the highest basketball IQ that I've personally ever witnessed as a fan, that keeps this man in the condition that he's still unbelievably in. But despite LeBron's dedicated greatness, the fact that he's won four championships with four undisputed finals MVPs, with a definitively flawless legacy whether it's on a basketball court or with his political influence, he still gets hate from a guy like Mario Chalmers, who recently stated on the record that no player in the NBA has ever been afraid of LeBron. Ironically, Chalmers wouldn't have his name being replayed in rap songs, wouldn't have multiple rings, not to mention any figure of wealth in his bank account if it wasn't for the king, yet he's still a jealous hater. Pretty impressive. That's why it was great to see LeBron's current cast of teammates interrupt his post-game interview with goat noises. You can make shots offensively. You got to be able to get stops down the stretch, you know, especially when you're uh, playing against teams that's been scoring. So, uh, we had to get stops, and we did that. Hey, Brian, I, 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 where you get this dude from? Man? I, I got to say, focus. I'm locked in, y'all. All right, brother. Hey, just, just, like, just like a bad boy. Get his and Austin Avenue. They come out 26 and 10. Because whether you think it's James or Jordan, there's no denying LeBron James is the greatest teammate in the history of basketball. His ability to classily yet aggressively lead his troops is second to none. And when you think about it, the three greatest players of the modern era in Stephen Curry, Kevin Durant, and LeBron all have one thing in common. These three are all first-class teammates whose contagiously positive energy can be an embraced father-like presence to members of his team who are in need of mentoring. That said, when you do either LeBron, Durant, or Curry wrong, these dogs don't hesitate to bite back. Just think of how Durant left Westbrook for challenging him as the number one option in OKC. How Curry humiliated Chris Paul after CP3 kicked him off the court in warm-ups of a conference finals game or how LeBron annually eliminated a Dwayne Casey-led Raptor team with championship written all over it, practically by himself. How LeBron recently clapped back at Mario Chalmers defines how the dog from some of the greatest to ever lace him up can bite back. About right after Rio's recent take stating that no one was ever afraid of LBJ, in an IG post, LeBron said, quote, to a non-believer, we hear all the chatter going on behind our backs but they want to smile in our faces when they see us, end quote. I'm sure Mario Chalmers expresses nothing but gratefulness anytime he sees LeBron face to face, which makes that classy revenge post from James astutely accurate. Despite the fact that the city I call home is named LeBronto, last night watching a game of the year contender against Utah, I'm not gonna lie to you, it was cool to be on the other side of it getting hyped after beastly LeBron takes to the bucket one after the next, as inspirationally humble and calm, cool, and collected as he is, LeBron had a great point about the Lakers as a collective unit post-game. Uh, it's all about chemistry. The more minutes we can get on the floor with one another, the better we'll be. Meanwhile, here was LeBrow on whether or not he or James would suit up on the second night of a back-to-back -back against the Clippers, which takes place in merely a few hours after this recording. You know, tomorrow, obviously, I haven't played in back-to-back -back in, in a long time. I played like 42 minutes or something like that, so... Probably the most I've played since I've been back. So, I mean, you know, you know we all get on a phone call or something tomorrow. And just, Let's and be fair to the there. Utah Jazz, though, whose crowd made this an incredible environment and whose team was severely shorthanded. While the Lakers were without debatably their third best player in deloading, they were up eight points with under three minutes left. And as a veteran ball club, don't have any excuse for not closing out the game better. Darvin Ham had a good point post game about this team fighting through adversity but you simply have to be a more disciplined ball club in those situations if you're going to be a championship caliber team in a few months time. That said, Rui gamebred Hachimura continued to beast down low in the post, scoring a crucial 17 piece off the pine, 
Dennis Schroeder stepped up for D'Lo's absence in the starting five with an 18-piece. Additionally, I thought it was another active performance from Wenyan Gabriel, and Troy Brown Jr. had a pesky defensive showing as per usual. This team's ability to play efficient basketball in both the half court as well as in transition is going to benefit them tremendously come playoff time. One thing they need to do better is communicate on the defensive glass. I see them running into each other a lot, but going back to that point about their balanced attack, the Lakers are number seven across the NBA in both points per game in transition and points per game in ISOs. Over the course of a seven game series, if they get that far, of course, an opposing team's game planning is often based around taking away one of those two things, either your transition scoring or your half court scoring. The Lakers are a conundrum for opponents because they can dominate in both areas. For LeBron James, while his spirit will one day reincarnate like all of ours, it's safe to say from his persona to his talent to his dedication, there will never be a duplication of LeBron Ramon James. Two shoutouts from my last upload and this one next time, but what's your favorite LeBron moment of all time? I'll give my most heartbreaking one, his runner over top OG Ananobi in 2018's conference semis. Thanks a lot for that one, Bron. But let me know your best LeBron moment down below. This was D-Flow and peace.